I'm Sam Miller, an interpreter here at Jamestown Settlement, and for our Going to the Source series, I have chosen one of the most important works of medicine in the early 17th century, The Surgeon's Mate by John Wilton. They made a distinction back then between doctors and surgeons. Doctors are like general practitioners today. They are the ones who diagnose patients, offer treatments, study anatomy and rare diseases, and help to further the cause of medical science. They go to medical school. Surgeons are the ones who actually get their hands dirty. They're the ones who actually perform the procedures on the body, and they have an apprenticeship. Uh, John, uh, John Woodall started his apprenticeship rather late, at the age of 16, and did not complete it. He got his experience at the age of 19 studying under Lord Willoughby when they were fighting in Normandy. Uh, and uh, it's the same company that a young adventurer by the name of John Smith got his, some of his experience as well. He traveled extensively on the continent, from Poland to Germany, before he came back to England and became a member of the Company of Barber Surgeons. He also served as a surgeon at the St. Bartholomew's Hospital, where he was a colleague of William Harvey, who was the doctor who uh, eventually cracked the code of the circulatory system and realized that it was a closed system. But he really made his money uh, as a surgeon general for the East India Company. At this time, England is trying to play catch up to Portugal and Spain and France. Um, they are in creating a global trade network. They've established the Muscovy Company, the Eastland Company, there's now the East India Company, and he provides medical instruments and surgeons' chests for these companies. And he also uh, provides uh, surgical instruments uh, to a, a fledgling company known as the Virginia Company, which would establish the Jamestown colony here. With the first company that arrived here in Virginia in 1607, there were two surgeons, uh, Thomas Wooten and William Wilkinson. Their services are pretty essential here, especially in the first year. The English were not accustomed to the hot and humid climate. They didn't expect it to be so tropical. And Virginia was experiencing one of its worst droughts in centuries. When you're not getting enough freshwater rain upstream of the James, and you're getting backwashes of salt from the Chesapeake Bay, you end up with the water being much more brackish, far too salty to be consumed. As with a paucity of fresh water, uh, the disease became rampant. You see examples of waterborne illness like typhoid, typhus, dysentery, and uh, as, well, as well as the malaria that they had brought with them. Uh, of the 104 men who arrived in 1607, less than half that number would live to see the next year. Thomas Wooten himself succumbed from disease the first year. The Surgeon's Mate was published by John Woodall in 1617, with a new edition being published in 1636. It's really one of the first of its kind being a medical textbook. The book is fascinating because it's published at a time when medical science is very much in transition. It used to be that surgeons were using the works of Greek physicians like Hippocrates and Galen. Uh, for example, the idea that the body is regulated by four major liquids, blood, phlegm, yellow bile, and black bile, which are connected to the four classical elements, earth, fire, water, and air. This book reflects a new uh, school of thought that was made popular by Paracelsus, who was an early Renaissance doctor. He rejected the ideas of the four humors and of the elements, uh, and instead he, was, he believed that everything was composed of three major elements, uh, salt, mercury, and sulfur. So while the idea of there being three elements is rather symbolistic to our minds, it was also the beginnings of a serious interest in chemistry. And parsley in medicine is about changing alchemy from being the pursuit of changing metals into gold to having more practical applications, most notably using chemicals as medicine. 
the idea that inorganic compounds used in certain combinations can be used to treat certain diseases. So instead of trying to regulate the body's humors, it's about introducing uh, new elements that can be used to cure the diseases. And the book reflects a lot of the chemistry involved in that. The book is divided into several sections. Uh, the first part is an introduction given to apprentices about their duties. And he mentions that there are three duties for the surgeon and the surgeon's apprentice. Duty to God, duty to their patient, and duty to their master. In, in the case of the apprentice, to their, the chief surgeon. Then he breaks down all the different instruments that should be in a surgeon's case. And it's the most comprehensive list of instruments that has ever been seen in, in a manual such as this. And he also even has illustrations of several of the instruments that are used. He then talks about uh, different types of medicines and their uses. He talks about specific types of medical conditions that require certain attention. He also talks about very specific medical cases that are of particular concern at this time, uh, particularly for those who are on sea voyages, such as the treatment of gunshot and the treatment of scurvy. And then he has a glossary of some chemical terms and chemical symbols, and he even ends the book with a bit of verse, verse being very popular in the age of Shakespeare, uh, as an instructive measure for teaching about Parcelian medicine. A lot of people today have a rather limited understanding of what medicine was like in history. A lot of the stories that people have heard about are from, come from um, medicine of the Middle Ages, which was rife with quackery and superstition, or about frontier medicine, or about battlefield medicine, such as the barbaric techniques that were used during the American Civil War. But that only paints a small picture of the pursuit of medicine at this time. One thing that a lot of people are surprised to learn is that there was an understanding that you needed to be clean. Nothing is going to be sterile by our modern sense of the term. We've only been sterile by our modern standards since the end of the 19th century. However, they didn't understand that a healthful environment contributes to good health. And in the first section of the book, where he breaks down all the different instruments that should be in a surgeon's case, it is interesting to note that for most of these entries, one of the things he mentions is that the instrument should be kept clean and it should be in good condition. Uh, the metal instruments, for example, like a lancet or a scalpel, he believed uh, should be kept in oil at all times, and you should only take it out when you're using it, and you should only use one of these at a time and put it back in the oil cloth when not in use. They were very concerned about rust. They also uh, cleaned their instruments oftentimes with things like wine and vinegar. So they didn't understand about trying to keep their instruments clean. An instrument that I find particularly fascinating, if a bit gruesome, is an instrument that Woodall says shouldn't be used lightly, and it only should be used in very specific cases. And that is an instrument called the trepan or trephine. A trepan is an instrument that is used for drilling into the skull. A trephine is a similar instrument that is used to make a larger hole in order to remove a piece of the skull away. Uh, that is called what we would call today a craniotomy. Why on earth would you use an instrument such as this? Well, you had, let's say that you had a sailor here at Jamestown who was moving a barrel, unloading a barrel from one of the ships. There was an accident. The, the rope and pulley system broke. The barrel fell and struck him on the head. And then, not long afterwards, the sailor starts behaving very strangely. He's vomiting, he's uh, getting a fever, and he's getting convulsions that are making him shake. The surgeon would know from these symptoms that what is occurring is that blood is filling up between the brain and the skull. That's called, we call it today, a subdural hematoma. If the blood continues to fill inside the head, the pressure of the blood against the brain will become fatal. So the only recourse is to, for the surgeon to use an instrument like this to drill a hole into the skull to drain the blood and relieve the pressure on the brain. But Woodall warned against using this instrument too freely, and he says that it only attendeth in fractures of the cranium, and yet scarce one in ten have occasion for the use thereof. For we see daily many grievous fractures healed without it. 
And in fact, he mentions that some German uh, surgeons will go an entire year and never pick this device up. He also gives some suggestions to surgeons' apprentices on how to practice using the trepan. Uh, I therefore would advise a young artist to make some experience on a calf's head or a sheep's head till he can weld and easily take out a piece of the bone. So shall it more easily be done on a man without error. As a colonist here in Virginia, most of the week you're going to do whatever job you were hired to do by the company, whatever you signed a contract to do. But some days of the week, you're going to be a guard. So if you didn't have military experience before, you're going to have it now. There was always a concern this place could be attacked at any time by the Spanish or by the Powhatan. Some of these men had never used a firearm before, had never fired a musket. And it is a possibility that during a training exercise, there might be an accident and uh, one of the soldiers might get shot. Now that sounds kind of funny, but we know in real life it happened at least once. On display at historic Jamestown, there is a skeleton which still has a bullet stuck in his tibia, in his leg bone. So we know that accidents do happen, and based on the angle, it was almost certainly an accident. So the surgeon in Jamestown is not going to be removing a lot of bullets, but it can happen, and he needs to be ready. Plus, there's always a possibility they might be fired upon by the Spanish. If a patient gets shot with a bullet, first, the surgeon will need to locate the bullet. There are no x-rays. Oftentimes, a surgeon will use an instrument called a probe, and they'll use that to carefully, carefully locate the bullet in the wound. You'll feel for metal touching metal. Once he has located the bullet, he can then extract it using a pair of forceps. However, it may not be that easy and he may need to use other instruments to get the bullet out. For example, the bullet might have gone all the way in and gotten embedded in the bone. And if it's lodged in the bone, the forceps may not be strong enough to extract it. So you have to resort to a drill called a terebulum. And that is used to drill a hole into the bullet. See, the bullets are made of lead, and lead is a softer metal than steel. So and this is the same method that you would use to extract a bullet that was stuck in the barrel of a musket. Once the bullet is removed, you'll need to wash out the wound. You'll need to use some wax thread and suture up the wound. And then you'll need to apply a salve. That's a bandage that has been soaked in wine or vinegar. Sometimes they use forms of sulfur, like oil of vitriol. And you bind up the wound with a salve to help it heal. Establishing these global trade networks will require very long sea voyages across the Indian Ocean and across the Atlantic. And as soon as a ship is in open sea, the clock is ticking. Because after a month or so, the sailors are going to start suffering from scurvy. We know today that scurvy is a disease that is caused by a vitamin C deficiency. Uh, vitamin C provides the uh, collagen, the connective tissue in your body, the glue that holds you together. You go without vitamin C for a month or so, and that starts to break down. You experience sores, and you get bruised very easily. Your teeth start to bleed and get loose, and eventually it can become fatal. The Surgeon's Mate contains a chapter about the treatment of scurvy, and it contains some actually forward thinking. He didn't understand why it worked but he had made observations that certain types of juices are useful against scurvy. That on sea voyages where they consumed the juice of lemons, limes, tamarinds, and oranges, that it helped to prevent scurvy from becoming a problem. Unfortunately, his advice was not widely accepted, uh, be partly because he had no uh, scientific knowledge to back it up. He only had the observations. And really, you're not going to see any serious treatment of scurvy well into the end of the 18th century and into the 19th century. John Woodall never came to Virginia, but he was very definitely important behind the scenes. He was influential in propagating medical knowledge to the New World. And his work would certainly be an important asset to the Virginia Company of London. So if you're ever considering becoming a surgeon in the early 17th century, before you decide, you might want to read The Surgeon's Mate and decide if you have steady enough hands and a strong enough stomach. Thank you for joining me today. If you've enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, and comment. And please check out our other videos in this series.